All right, let's get started. Uh, yeah, so uh, welcome uh, for the morning session. And the first speaker of the day is uh, Samuel Kaski uh, from Aalto University and University of Manchester. Yes, you can get started. All right, thanks for the introductions. And I can hear myself very, very loudly, so hopefully you also can hear. But should we do something about that? Is it too loud? So I hope that everybody behind Zoom also can hear and see. I'm, I'm trying not to use any a laser pointer so that you guys can follow what I'm speaking. Uh, okay, I'll start little by little while my volume is tuned down. Now, now I think, no, okay, not yet quite. All right, okay, okay, let's get started then. So I'm going to talk about two topics. So one is, uh, a practical vision uh, on or conceptual plus practical vision on how machine learning can efficiently and effectively help multiple fields. And the other one is, is uh, how to formulate the machine learning problem uh, of how can the domain experts maximally help machine learning reach machine learning goals or vice versa, which is that they are, uh, we have a human expert ultimately, but in the beginning, it's of course a formulated uh, kind of model expert uh, working with an assistant, uh, and, and our question is that can we formulate the assistant such that the problem solution is better than either of them could do alone. So the beginning part of the talk is, is very much based on a white paper or vision paper that we wrote with colleagues of Patrick uh, and Ardo Klami from FKI as well, and, and then the Turing Institute uh, folks uh, from UK and Ola Inquist from AstraZeneca, who is doing drug design. Uh, and and uh, this initiative we call Virtual Laboratories, uh, and, and I'll try to explain a bit on what we mean by that. So now, uh, in drug design, there is, they call this experimental loop, design, make, test, analyze cycle. But I'm sure you guys under the notice similar thing, you may have slightly different words in here. But the same cycle is, of course, underlying all empirical sciences and all design work, if, uh, whether it's in, in, in um, uh, sciences or, or engineering. So drug design very much is uh, operating on, on this cycle and, and engineering design in, in uh, designing engines, for instance. Uh, so this is old stuff, of course. But what has changed, as we all know, is that nowadays this cycle first operates in simulations based on simula simulations of models or directly learning or optimizing models, and only then in the outer loop going to the real world and, and validating, verifying the findings of the simulations. So uh, what, how the world seems to work at the moment is that each field separately develops their own tools. So for instance, Patrick and others has a very nice package on doing Bayesian optimization in materials research, uh, drug designers have a package that is called differently, but essentially has the same functionality and likewise for the other fields. So now uh, each field, uh, I'm not going to lecture you about material science, but, but I'm, I'm sure that you have two kinds of tools. I would categorize the tools in two categories. One is tools that are specific to your field and it wouldn't make sense to generalize them anywhere, right? Now I'm calling them uh, material science tools. But then there are tools that do generalize and Bayes optimization, Bayesian optimization would be one instance of those. Or general purpose modeling toolboxes, of course, would be that as well. Uh, then the specifics of the models will vary by field. So now if we call uh, those methods that generalize AI methods, now very loosely using the word AI here. Now we have an obvious opportunity which is underlying very much the, uh, the progress of AI is, is scale advantage. So if we can develop one tool that can be built on in, in several fields, we only have to build it once and we can build it to be better if we cooperate on those, right? So uh, by realizing that there are tools that generalize that often are called AI tools, we have a potential for scale advantage. And this is exactly what, what this virtual laboratories movement is, is meant to build on. 
Now that all fields are simulation based, and if we have common interfaces so that we can have these AI methods working across these fields, we can also ask the next AI question that what if, so what kinds of AI tools would be even more useful than the ones that we have now or, or which we are thinking of building now? And I'm particularly interested in, as, as I started this talk with uh, thinking of can, can we build AI that would actually be useful for humans in, in col uh, uh, collaborate usefully with humans so that the results would be better than with either of them alone. And human in the loop approaches would be, some of them would be kind of simple instances of this, but you can think of, think that how far can you go, right? And that's what I call collaborative AI. So the uh, kind of field which tries to develop these kinds of new tools that, that I would call collaborative AI. So here's an instance of, of the fields that I know the best uh, of, of the ones that I mentioned, truck design. So in, in, in there, you would run these loops first in simulations uh, in order to develop a molecule that best finds uh, an intended target and doesn't have uh, undesired consequences such as being toxic. And then you valid validate them in ultimately, first in simulations, then assays, and then, then in an animal experiments. And now you guys can tell me better what, how, how this runs in materials uh, science that I'm not saying anything about that. So what do we need uh, as the interfaces or the common elements in order to, for this to work? And this was our vision in this paper. So we essentially need to have digital twins, which, which are models with connection to the data that, that is being used for estimating them. So we need to have digital twins of the process that we are studying. It would be the specific material with its properties in your case. Uh, and, and then we need to have digital twins of the instruments that you guys would be using for studying the materials. And this is of course not necessary, but I mean, the results are more interpretable if you can use the kinds of interfaces that you are used to, right? Uh, and then if we want to go to the collaboration, then I'd argue that we need to have some digital twins of you guys as well, so that the assistant can help you maximally. I mean, how else would it know what you want, right? And that's what I will be arguing in, the, in this work, that we need to build those. All right, and then we need to have some software layers and, and so on. Uh, so what's, what are the benefits? So I'm calling you guys here a domain scientists, right? Materials uh, science is one domain, truck design would be another domain. Uh, so what you can gain from this is if you want to set up this kind of simulation uh, cycle in, in a new problem, you potentially can do it much easier by, by common interfaces. Uh, and then additionally, you get to use all the newest versions of AI tools if they have been developed with the same interfaces. Sounds like a, a decent deal, uh, lots for free. A bit of effort is needed in order to get this cycle going. Uh, so for machine learning researchers, AI researchers, why is this useful? Is uh, Many of us, I'm, I'm very much an AI researcher, but I work with many other fields, uh, experts of many other fields, including material science. But so, uh, and why I do that is that I actually would like to make a difference for the good and not for the bad. So for, if I would go working for, let's say, some of the unmentioned tech uh, giants, I might be developing uh, applications where I have absolutely no control over and, and which, which don't seem to all be going to a good direction. And, and I would very much like to uh, improve or make help make science more efficient because that's the general purpose, uh, the problem solving technique that we, we actually as, as humanity have. And sorry if this is too high flying, but I, I think that really is my underlying motivation in doing this. Uh, so I, I would get more easy, uh, I would be able to work more easily with my collaborators if we had common interfaces. Because we wouldn't need to start from scratch first, uh, establishing common vocabulary, then establishing common data standards and so on. If those would have been fixed already and interfaces towards my algorithms, so that I can just think of my algorithm and how, do, how can we make the experimental design loop more efficient then I could do my work more efficiently. And I would be able to also 
uh, get better papers which which are with you guys uh, which where we have real applications instead of the just toy demos all right so we have started uh, with a small team of FKI uh, people, two postdocs, Chris and Carlos, and then Professor Arto Klami and myself, started setting up the first version of this kind of a software ecosystem, software layer. And, and now, by having these four names, does not mean that we would be driving the, all of this. No, we, we just wanted to kickstart it so that others can now join and, and build on it. And, and we, we will be very glad to list, uh, add more names to this list. So I'm not going to say anything about this application. There are better experts on that there, but in, in, a, in an uh, optimization cycle in, in material science, uh, where, where the space, uh, sorry, the, the sp design space in this case is, a, is the two dimensional triangle. <laughs> I, and I'm now assuming that you guys would like to think in terms of flow diagrams when you write down what you act, what the system actually does, then you can draw a flow diagram on the left, which gets transformed into an XML uh, interface to the loop that then actually runs the experimental design things. So this is what the common interface looks like roughly. And as said, so the idea is that, that uh, we will need to build this together. So if you want to have really good interfaces to material science for these common virtual laboratory tools, then you need to tell or preferably actually code it in there so that it works. And now in FKI, Pat Patrick, Army, Militia have been involved in this. So those, those feedbacks will certainly be in there. Okay, that was the virtual laboratory side. So if, if I then move to the second part of my talk, which is how, how could the experts, you guys, and, and the AI machine learning algorithms, could, how could they work maximally well together? So I'll start with the big picture, kind of the, the dream vision, and, and then start talking about concrete first steps uh, towards this. So it would be really nice to have tools that we could think of as sidekicks. And some, that our tools would have a bit more intelligence in, in being able to actually help us even without telling precisely what the tools need to do. So, I mean, if we think of them as current tools, uh, we, need, we need to tell them every step, essentially by programming. Some of the interfaces seem more fluent, like, like for instance, Alexa, if you try to get it to do anything, it seems more fluent. It's actually listening to what you say and, and it may even understand something. No, it doesn't. Uh, there is just a common language and you have to hit the right words in the right order and then it does what you want, right? So it's, you essentially have to program it. Now, there is of course some hope that with the large language models, we may change this, but if you want to be sure that it actually does what you want at the moment, you still need to tell precisely what it wants. So could we have tools that would do this better? So then they would complement us instead of us having to program them directly for every single step, which is tedious. We could just tell that I would like to get this result uh, out if, if, it is, if it exists. So uh, try out, please. That would be a nice uh, in, uh, interface for an assistant. So, uh, so what is needed for this? Uh, now, now this is the big picture view. So we need tools that are, are modeling the world together with us. I mean, if we are in a modeling business, we believe that model is the way how we want to capture the regularities in the world. And as I hinted, we also need to have the digital twin of the user. So the, it needs to, the tool also needs to model us to a sufficient extent that it can disambiguate what we really mean which is necessary if we want to give unclear instructions. If we are happy giving programs as instructions, then of course, that's the way to communicate. I would like to be able to tell something slightly more fuzzy, and then the system would say that, oh, did you mean this one? And if I say yes, then it goes and does it. Right? And for that, it needs to have some model of what I might mean so that it can disambiguate it uh, in an active design loop. All right, so uh, back to the track design. So there, the uh, 
current tools or one, one branch of the current tools for designing drugs are based on reinforcement learning algorithms, sequential decision making algorithms, which are very clever at spitting out candidate molecules when we give them an objective function. Now, the problem is that we are really bad. I, I'm really bad, but even the professionals doing drug design are, are really bad at, at nailing down the objective function at first go precisely. And now, uh, a, a kind of layman's example is that if, if you forget to uh, add in the cost function that minus uh, toxicity effects, then most of the drugs that it produces will kill the people instead of cure them. I mean, this is obviously a simple, uh, trivial example. They know how to handle this, but the, uh, the nice property and, and nasty property of reinforcement learning is that it, it will certainly find the, all the solutions, shortcuts that you didn't intend. So uh, designing drugs is at the moment, the state of the art of designing drugs is you write down a cost function, then you see what molecules come out and you go, oh shit, I, <laughs> that's, that's way off. Uh, and, and then you redesign. It's like doing keyword search in old school Google, which may be transformed with the, with the Bings and so on, but the, at the moment it's very similar. So now because it is this kind of a cycle, iterative cycle, that gives us an opportunity of having an AI that actually makes recommendations that are better and, and learns about the user, the model of the user that I was talking about while it goes, right? So that's what we are trying to do. So if we start uh, formulating the problem, what, what does this look like as a machine learning problem? Here it is in a, in a nutshell. We have an agent, which ultimately is the human designer, operating in an environment, trying to solve a problem in an environment, taking some actions and observing states of the environment. And now if we want to install an assistant, this would be the formal way of formulating it, is that the assistant does not act in the environment directly, it only gives advice. So it's the A prime here. So the assistant is an agent which takes actions uh, and the action is, is to give recommendations to the human, but now the human decides whether they actually accept it or not. Right. So the assistant has no way of controlling the world directly. It has to get an approval from its host first, which is the nice property why, why it can't then go off and, and do something uh, wild. Uh, so now it, it really complements us. So now this is the problem it needs to solve. Now, uh, what I've uh, drawn here, or, or Sebastian, my PhD student, has drawn here is, is uh, picture of what turns out to be a POMDP, partially observable Markov decision process uh, in a simple game setting. And now we can generalize this to more complex settings and, and different kinds of interactions. And in, in the POMDP, the, uh, the environment, so the transition function and the rewards come, come then from the uh, agent, so the human who it is trying to help. All right. Let's start with the simplest case, uh, knowledge elicitation or human in the loop, uh, machine learning as some would call it. So now we don't have an environment, we have an assistant which is uh, making questions one way or the other to the agent. So the questions don't need to be verbal questions, they can be changing the interface and seeing how the behavior changes and so on. All right, and, and, and typically the goal now would be to try to squeeze out the knowledge out of the agent uh, uh, in order to do their common modeling task later better. So if I start with a concrete example in, in personalized medicine in this case. So we have an uh, expert who is a doctor whose task is to prescribe a treatment to a patient uh, in, in uh, precision medicine settings, so they have variable, as variables for the prediction, you have all the genetic variables, some millions of them, and, and now uh, you try to decide would this specific uh, drug be useful uh, for these kinds of patients. And now uh, in this simple system, the system is asking the expert, do you think that this particular drug might be useful for curing, uh, sorry, I need to start again. So that do you think that this uh, particular feature, genetic feature would be useful in predicting whether that uh, drug would be useful for this patient? So this is a difficult question to ask, but for some, and most times they have to answer, I don't know, but sometimes they do know. And then that's extremely useful compared to a system which doesn't know. I mean, this is what the human in the loop knowledge is about. 
So now, now my question as machine learner is, is to design this so that with minimal number of questions, it gets maximal output or ma maximal improvement in prediction power. And why this is difficult is because we have too, way too many variables, millions in this case, and we only have a few observations, a few patients from which we need to learn the prediction task. This cannot be done with any uh, statistical method without uh, uh, making lots of prior assumptions. And that's what we are talking about here, squeezing out the prior assumptions out of an expert. So uh, compared now, if we plot the performance as a function of how many questions from the expert we have asked, uh, the black line on the top is, is if we ask random questions. So there's lots of que potential questions here. So by, by 1,000 questions, the predictions have not improved at all. If we then do active learning with Bayesian experimental design techniques, we can get to 70% of available uh, performance improvement uh, by 1% of the queries out of all the potential queries. So a huge uh, improvement in efficiency. Uh, similar techniques are being used in drug design. So there is a reinforcement learning system, as I mentioned, which is spitting out sets of molecules, then asking the human expert to see which of these are more useful and then the performance improves as a function of how many times you run this loop. The particular question which many of you are probably asking right now is that what if the expert doesn't know, right? And the, of course, the expert may not know whether they know or not, at least I don't always. So my students ask all kinds of questions to me and I, I think my questions, my answers may be random sometimes. So, um, so now it turns out that it is possible to give guarantees that if, if you take an expert, which, which we would now formulate here as an unreliable information source, right? And the expert who knows what they are doing is, it would be reliable in the sense that the answers are actually useful. Uh, experts who don't, they, they wouldn't. Uh, the abstract version of this is that we have several information sources. One is the actual experimental measurement data. Uh, the others can be experts or some other information sources. And the question here is that what if I add a new information source? Can I guarantee that the result does not decrease? And, and the answer is that yes, yes, we can guarantee. Of course, we need to pay a price, which is that we may need to ask a few additional questions, but not too many. I'm not going to details on this. Uh, I'm sure Petrus, for instance, would love to give a talk on this. Uh, bigger problem is, I mean, this we now can handle, I think, really decently. It's, it's not the full-blown solution. There's, by the way, there's lots to be studied still in that problem, but this is the opening of that field. Uh, but now moving to, to an even more difficult question is that we experts, or, or you are experts, I'm, I'm just pretending. So uh, experts uh, typically wouldn't think that they are there to give feedback to the machine learning system, right? I assume that you want to solve a material science problem instead of uh, spending your day answering to the stupid machine what, which I gave you, right? So uh, at least I'm using my computer so that I think that I am driving it and I would do all the shortcuts if, if it's really stupid, right? So now if, if uh, human in the loop machine learning actually assumes that we are passive providers of data, we may make errors, but they, the errors don't have structure, right? Typically that's the assumption, uh, IID errors. So now uh, usually if we are really driving, we have an agenda and, and our answers will depend on our agenda. So now, uh, can, what can we do about that? And, and by the way, I could show simple examples of where, where the machine will actually completely misunderstand what was meant because the user had an agenda of actually driving things instead of just answering passively. Uh, so what can we do about that? And the answer here is if, if you are modelers, as I think I am, uh, then your answer is probably the same as mine, is that we need to model this. And now the problem there, uh, so we need to have a model of the, how does the user answer? So observation model of the user, like, like you would have an observation model for a microscope or whatever you are doing, using for, for measuring materials. Uh, now the problem here, of course, is that kind of building a model, a complete model of a human is, is completely unfeasible. 
that would be harder than the artificial general intelligence task, which, which might take a few years still. So we need to find a way of finding simpler models. And by what, what I mean by simple is that let's put in some sufficient information about the about from cognitive science on, on how humans behave and let's restrict the problem setting. So let's not assume that the human can do just anything. Of course, so let's assume that you would try to actually solve the problem, for instance, which already limits the problem quite a bit. So now uh, it is possible to uh, formulate humans, uh, human behavior as simulators, cognitive scientists are doing this. So then we need to be able to do inference on simulators, which would be simulator-based inference, approximate Bayesian computation or, or uh, simulation-based inference by, by some. Uh, that we can do. The problem is that this is really complicated and still we probably don't have, sorry, compu computationally complex and, and we still don't have a kind of co complete principle on, on how would we derive these for different tasks uh, in cognitive science so far. That is about to change. Now, uh, there's a really nice principle. I, I think this is really nice principle of thinking. Uh, I, I, I'll just make a couple of axioms uh, and, and then I shall uh, tell you how, how to form a human model for, for these kinds of tasks. So the axioms are, are that first, uh, we assume that humans don't usually intentionally shoot themselves in the foot. That might not go for all prime ministers of all countries <laughs> in recent years, for instance, but the American, most people wouldn't, uh, would prefer not to, right? So that you would try to, if, if you set out to solve a problem, which is the premise, then you would actually try to solve it, right? Instead of doing something completely different. So if, if we make this assumption, and if we know what are the limitations in, in your way of solving the problem, we humans obviously have memory limitations, some other limitations, and especially we don't have infinite amount of time to allocate to solving a problem. So that's called bounded rationality. So that we are rational, as rational as we can within some bounds. So if we now can know the bounds, then we can infer, we can set up a, a POMDP, and compute the optimal solution of that from DP. And then we add, assume that there's some noise on top of that. And there's your user model. The question is just that where do the bounds come from? Partially from cognitive science, partially we need to infer them by setting up a model family with a few parameters describing them and inferring them. And that's it. Now, the remaining problem is that this is computationally incredibly complex because you need to essentially solve a PomDB as a forward problem in every single iteration when you do this. Uh, now, let's use the uh, most advanced uh, machine learning techniques, which, which, which would, call, would be called amortization. So, compute a neural network surrogate for this. So we just have a paper in, in archive uh, that's called differentiable user models, which is essentially what I just said. It's coming out in, in oh no, we don't yet know where it's coming out, sorry. Hopefully it's coming out someday. All right. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, I will actually then quickly go through, not the general th setting, I'll, I'll bring up a particularly interesting problem, which is the hardest problem I can think of, which is called zero shot assistance. So now we set up the assistant who needs to help a user and it knows no, nothing about the user except it knows the problem uh, domain. How do you solve this one? So it needs to build the model based on the feedback. Essentially, it needs to identify both the user model and, and the solution based on the feedbacks. So if we uh, set this up, it needs to have a model of how the human plans. But if we make simple assumptions about that, uh, then for a problem, which is actually a really difficult problem, but it's easy to explain. So think of going for, to Paris for a day trip, and you need to decide which, which places do you visit in what order. And you have some preferences in mind, and, and typically those would include cost and time available, but some others as well. So how do you solve this? This is a traveling salesman problem for each, solo, each selection of these. So at, at least beyond my capabilities, given five points already, right? if I'm in a, in a rush. 
So now let's have an AI which kind of tries to compute the solutions that I need uh, in order to infer this as, as efficiently as it can uh, and, and then suggest. So now if you, if you look at the uh, green curve here, that, that's as a number of uh, iterations, interactions with the agent which goes so that it suggests a change to the route and then I say whether I like it or not, right? So as a number of iterations, the, uh, the green one uh, is what uh, people would be able to do without assistance. Then the blue ones are with the assistance with the principles that I was showing. The two different variants and I, uh, in the interest of time in skipping those. And, and jumping to the conclusion, what is still needed? So uh, this is the worldview that I've uh, described. So we have a user and AI together solving a problem in the world. We need to have world models that would be the classical machine learning that we are doing and you guys are doing uh, in your domain. Uh, machine learners try to help build tools that help you do that. Uh, then we need to have the user model and an AI which is running, simulating what the user does with the world in order to help, help maximally. Uh, and then if we would have these tools, we would hopefully be able to do science much better. So now we would need other people who want to join this virtual AI labs movement in, in developing uh, better tools for themselves, right? All right, thanks a lot. Thank you for the very inspiring talk. Uh, is there questions in the audience or in the remote audience? Thank you. Um, you were emphasizing the a human as a decision maker, basically. Um, and I was wondering, um, hyperparameter optimization, for example, would be to replace the human uh, doing the decisions. And are you also considering modeling the human with an AI? Uh, so I, how I would say about the uh, kind of automating the decision maker, yes, of course, we would want to automate as much as is feasible, but there are two reasons why we wouldn't want to do that in all cases. One is that, that uh, experts often have knowledge that is not available to the AI system. And the other one is that ultimately, at least I would like to remain in control, right? Otherwise we will just build factories that do everything. I mean, it would be nice to have a future where humans have a, have a place, right? Because this is going to happen. It's not going to happen because of some Terminator taking over. No, it's because that's business-wise better, right? It would be much nicer if we had some future. But yeah, I, I didn't understand your, the latter half of your question. No, I was just giving an example. So I think you answered the okay. question okay. perfectly. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the very inspiring talk, Sami. I should probably know the answer to this, but uh, I'm asking you anyway. Um, so you've, in drug design already, uh, tried out a lot of these uh, solutions, bringing humans into the loop. Do you already have sort of standardized ways of asking questions that can be templated and taken now to, to new domains? So we've seen at this workshop uh, a few examples now where human in the loop or human querying is emerging, but it seems uh, that most of the time we don't know yet how to best include human expert knowledge in, in the loop. So is there something we can already learn from other domains and, and get a little bit closer to your vision of sort of templating and, and generalizing? Yeah, excellent question. So no, unfortunately, I don't have good answers to that because I, I, I'm a very abstract thinker. So to me, that's simply kind of, you just optimize over the choices that you have. That's how I formulate this, right? So if, if there's uncertainty, then you include that in the base of the Bayesian optimization. So, uh, so, that's uh, there we need the combination of human computer interaction experts in that or cognitive science and then machine learners who are doing the things that we do. And that's of course what we can do in, in FKI. We just should set our minds in doing that. So that, that's, that's a project we could very well do. I, I'm sure that others are asking this question, but I haven't followed the literature on that one. No. Yeah. 
thank you for a very nice talk. Uh, I have a question. Did you consider to uh, add the knowledge of experts from a lab book, ideally digitized, but probably that's not the truth in most of the laboratories. But anyway, like the natural language processing, because there is lots of knowledge from there, which is written at least down. It's not like that the expert has it in mind and we, we don't need to dig it from there. So have you think of something like that? Thank you. Right. Yeah, excellent question. So, no, we didn't take that research question. I understand uh, why you're asking and it's usually important. But as you know, kind of a researcher needs to pick their problem that they solve. And that's a different problem. So they, there is there's big teams working on that problem specifically. And, and that's uh, I, I haven't specialized on that one. Absolutely important, of course. Yeah, thank you very much for this. It's a really cool vision you are putting out. So I was trying to understand so quantitatively how much possible improvement, how much time saving I could enjoy as a human. If I compare the amount of time or number of decisions I'd have to make to set up the workflow chart you showed versus the number of questions I'd have to answer as the agent, then can you give an estimate of the time saving? Or time saving of setting up the have, being able to have the system. No, I, I'm afraid. No, we don't have any evidence for me to answer sensibly to that. No, no, we have to use our hunches, respective hunches for that. Sorry about that. I would love to have an answer to this one. Then I would, by the way, have a startup which would be very successful if I was able to. <laughs> any other questions? Yes, let's continue. Thank you. So how do you deal with the issue that the assistant, uh, sorry, the assistant may change the expert? So when it's a requiring, so if the expert believes that, oh, this is a very good assistant, so he, he or she, you know, it gives me always the right answers, the assistant while learning the expert will actually never see the expert without the assistant. Yeah, so the, this is a cognitive scientific problem of uh, kind of uh, which which I, I'm aware of one formulation of this is is that we learn to delegate our kind of powers to tools that are more powerful, like with pocket calculators, maybe people were not anymore that that could in, in computing in their heads and and likewise, for instance, I've delegated my memory completely to notebooks. So. Uh, Yes, so that, that change will happen. So I, I, I don't think we are uh, dealing with these techniques to that. We humans need to choose whether we want that or not, right? So, but uh, that, that's the kind of negative side. Uh, if, I mean, if, if, if the question was, how do we avoid the negative sides, then that would be it. positive side. So uh, of course the human will learn as they go through this. And that can be modeled by modeling the learning. And in simple instances of, for instance, collaborative optimization, we can show that by, by having a model that has a model of how the human learns, it can help the human better. Okay, and then we take the final question. Okay, this was this was a very interesting ecosystems of methodologies for uh, for uh, eliciting knowledge um, from previously unexplored sources and then putting them together in a very constructive way. Um, I'm glad that you have uh, defect tolerance solutions for for humans who maybe don't have enough expertise or are not sure. Um, what about if the human simply doesn't know what they want? Maybe this is another cognitive problem, uh, not necessarily related to expertise, but is there any way that you could actually elicit or help the human actually uh, come to a conclusion about uh, what, what it is that they need or want um, in terms of the AI laboratory and to encode? One, one of the typical difficulties of working with some domain expert is that they simply are not able to pin down or articulate their need. Right. So I have two part answer to this. So first is the very positive side is, is that the, I, I think the whole vision of these assistants uh, is, is kind of built on the idea, on, on the problems where we don't, are not able to explicate, explicate precisely. And, and how we handle that is by having some latent variables describing what they might want and so on. So under the assumption that the human would ultimately know what they want, uh, be able to tell that, yeah, that's it once they see it. 
right? Under that assumption, we can we can solve this. But then there's the difficult longer term problem that kind of uh, which is related to your question partially is is that kind of we may become lazy in in the ways that we don't uh, yet understand the consequences of, right? So if if uh, uh, kind of if 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 our needs are catered for. Right, we, we don't need to actually strive for anything, and we may lose the initiative ultimately. And, and those kinds of problems we can't handle with with the technology. But of course, that's that's a topic that is being studied in psychology. For I mean, for kids, this is of course something that that parents would care about and help them get over it. Now the question is, who helps us adults? Thank you. All right, let's give the final thanks to someone. Thank you.